I remember going to see my sister in hospital when her first day in hospital. So the Austin Hospital here in Melbourne. Very, very hot day in February. And we got home from the hospital and I, my dad sort of left the dinner table very early and he went and just started cleaning up and I, I noticed he hadn't finished his dinner and it was a bit strange. I looked across at him and he was, I'll never forget this figure of him hunched over the kitchen sink and he was crying We're doing the dishes. And it was at that moment I realised how serious this illness was. Even when my sister was in hospital, I was like, yeah, but if she eats food, she gets better. So I'm a bit confused by this whole thing. But when I saw dad crying, I remember thinking, shit, this is really bad. And I remember looking at mum and my little brother, Josh, and it sort of, I was a bit slower to register what was going on, I guess, it taken me, maybe I was in denial, I don't know. But I remember thinking, fuck, we are not a happy family anymore. And it was a, a pretty devastating kind of moment or realisation um, and at that point, I remember becoming fascinated with the question, well, what is it, what the, <laughs> what is it that makes people happy? Like, what, like, and the reason was I didn't, I knew I couldn't fix my sister. I knew I couldn't, you know, I knew I couldn't, that was well beyond my, me as a 17, 16, 17 year old kid. But I, I wanted to know what I could do to help mum and dad to feel happy and my brother Josh to feel happy. And and I had no idea, I had absolutely no idea. I, there were a few things I was doing instinctively that when I look back on it, actually the reason a resilience project exists. Like I I learned that mum and dad love stories, like they love funny stories. And I, I knew if we sit down at dinner, I could tell really funny stories or really wildly embellished stories about my day and I could make them laugh. And if I did it, as soon as we sat down, I could do it before the argument started about food because there was always an argument about food, you know, um, every single night. These like extremely awful fights about food dad would never usually join in dad sort of had his head down looking very defeated but mum and my sister would just go at it and i my resentment would build for my sister but um yeah so that was when i was sort of 16 17 18 that all happened and i thought fuck what do you do to make people happy and i thought i'll i'll be a, I, I didn't know what i wanted to be until that point then i thought i'll be a teacher i'll go into teaching because then i could work with kids and help them not get a mental illness. I had no idea what I was doing, Mark. Like I wasn't there going, I had no formula back then of like, this is how I stop it. And I remember going to my first school as a teacher going, right, how do I stop these kids getting a mental illness? You know, they were 10 and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I just, yeah, I was, I, I loved teaching. I really loved it. But I, the whole time I was teaching and I know a lot of your audience will be quite entrepreneurial and um, very, kind, I guess, business focused or career focused for want of a bit of a term. But I remember back then, and a lot of people might, re might write, relate to this, but I remember as a teacher thinking, this is good, but I reckon I've got a lot more to offer. I don't know what, like I have no idea what, but I reckon I've got, I reckon I could do something really big, but I have no idea what. And then I sort of fucked around for the next four, five, six, seven years as a teacher, this whole time thinking there's something bigger for me, I don't know what. Um, and my partner at the time, my ex, my ex, um, well, my ex-fiance she is, she was desperate to travel and I was saying, no, no, I've got to do, I've got to do something big. I don't know what it is. I've got to set up something. I don't, I don't know what. And she's saying, well, I need to travel. And, and um, I always deep down felt like I wasn't quite good enough for her. So I was like, okay, whatever you want to do, we'll do that. And so I went and traveled. And I remember the whole time going, I'm 28. Um, I've got no money to my name. Like I've all, all the savings I had as a teacher, you don't get paid much as a teacher. I remember my first full-time gig as a teacher, I was on $40,000 for the year. That was my first in 2000 and four, I think it was. And so you don't save much when you, I wanted to live in Richmond, so it cost a bit of money. And, and I didn't, I remember all my savings went to this trip to India. And I'm like, what the fuck are we doing? Like we're 28, we've got no money and we're living in India. And then she said to me, we should do some volunteering. And I was like, fuck, not only we don't have money, we're now volunteering our expertise. <laughs> like this is just so counterintuitive to me. But again, she wanted to do it and I, I wasn't good at saying no to her. And so, Next thing I know, we're volunteering in the desert, in the Himalayan desert. In a, and I, they, they said to us, I was trying to get involved here and where we went because I was like, well, we can't, this is costing us money now. Like we, we want to save for a home surely and we've got zero and we're 28 years older. My, and my mates said, you know, they're getting these great jobs at the, one of the big four banks or their managers at different accounting firms and their physios. And I'm thinking, I've got no money and now I'm volunteering. Um, at least I'm going to work out, at least I'm going to, L like loser you're thinking loser totally totally and i would yeah, pretend yeah. the whole time to my mates i'm like yeah no nah, this is really good we're just we're volunteering here and it's a good thing to do but in my head i'm like i'm 28 i've uh, i haven't got a doll to my name and there's no i don't have a 
job. Like I left my job to go and do this. So I was, I was feeling, I pretended I was fine, but deep down I was feeling deeply insecure about where I was in the world. Like I was like, oh, I'm going nowhere here. So I said, let's find a place that's going to look after us at least. So I did a bit of digging and found this village that said, yeah, you, you can live with the principal as long as you're here and you get three meals a day. And I went, oh, you beauty, here we go. I'm on the way up here. <laughs> so, and I arrived in this village and I'll never forget the feeling of shock that I felt when I arrived. No running water. So we went water, you walk down to the river, half an hour, half an hour's walk. No electricity. Well, they, sorry, that's not true. They, they had ele electricity, but they couldn't afford to have it switched on in the village. And there were no beds, everyone sleeps on the floor. And no toilets, hole on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a yeah. There's no toilets. There's like do you, there's a. I was thinking about this this morning. Actually, it's funny you say this. You go onto the roof, and there's a missing floorboard or like a missing. It's like a mud brick home. There's a missing mud brick there in the roof, and whatever you're gonna do, go straight down into this hole, and it's like this separate room that faces out away from the. That's that's how you go to the toilet every morning, like through on the roof of this joint. You could see everyone else doing it on their roof. It's the weirdest thing. I remember the first time I went up there that I said to the principal, he goes, here's the toilet. And I was like, oh, so, sorry, so what do I, what do I do? And he goes, oh, I'll show you. I was like, no, 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 don't, 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 don't show me. Just <laughs> explain to me what you do. Anyway, so that was me there and I'm going, oh, well, I've really hit rock bottom here. Like this, it doesn't get, oh, I felt so homesick. I was like, I just need to go home and earn some money. Anyway, my first day teaching in this school. And again, I'm sort of painting the picture for entrepreneurial picture because I think the path towards I don't want to say success, but the path towards fulfillment or in whatever you want to do in your life is often, it's not what you think it's going to be. And often you feel like you're going backwards in order to go forward. So that's why I'm sort of telling these stories. But my first day in the school, I'm sitting there teaching the grade threes. There's no resources. There's nothing. I'm sitting there in a room. Kids are sitting on a dirt floor. There's a blackboard, one piece of chalk. There's no dust and I couldn't get away the, the stains on the board. So I'm and what on earth do I do here? 20 minutes into the class, I remember thinking to myself, there was a kid sitting in the front row, his name was Stunson. I remember thinking to myself, never, never in my life have I ever seen joy like this before. This kid's the happiest person I've ever met. I was just giggling. I was like, How's this? I was looking at, <laughs> looking across the desert going, there is nothing here. How the fuck is this kid so happy? I don't know what is going on. Um, the first, way, the first week went like that. I was going to be there for a couple of nights. I forgot I wanted to go home early. I was so in love with this place. I was so in love with these people. Second week went like that. And I'm really going to be there for two weeks. And I said to my, I said to Angela, I said, I, I can't leave here. She said, no, neither can I. The reason I was thinking I can't leave was I couldn't stop thinking about Georgia, my sister. I was thinking, how is this possible? We grew up in a loving family, a nice home, went to very good schools. We had everything you ever needed growing up in life. Yet my sister's in hospital with a mental illness, or she was back then. This kid, or all these kids I was meeting, no bed. They have two meals a day, most of them. It's rice, just rice, nothing else. Sleep on the floor, one pair of clothes. I've never seen joy like it in my entire life. And so long story short, Mark, I lived in the village for three and a half months. And in three and a half months, I, I just watched what those people did. I copied what they did profound imp impact on my life. I've never felt happy. I came back to Australia. I wanted to tell everyone about this stuff, but I knew I couldn't just turn up to schools. I wanted to tell schools. That's where I wanted to go and speak to at schools, but I knew I couldn't turn up to school and say, anyway, this kid in India does it. You should do it. Then you feel happy. So I went back to uni, did, did my postgrads. And again, that was a, another pretty big investment for at the time. And you got no money to go back to uni. And I think my master's cost me, I think it was around $54,000 at the time. And But all I did for that master's was look at the research that sat behind these three things, or those, sorry, I should just go back a bit. I saw three things that these people did every day in the village. And I wanted to know, is there any evidence that these things actually work? Has anyone done a, not, not questioning that they work for these people, but Australians are so skeptical. Like Australians are so skeptical of, of people who stand up and say, here's, a, here's an idea for you. They want to know. So I looked at the evidence. It turns out there's 40, 50 years of science and research screaming at us. If you want to feel happier, these things definitely help. So that was back in 2000. And, 11 um and i thought right very ambitiously just quit i just said no i'm not going to teach i'm going to go and talk to schools about this stuff and and again i tell this story because i think people find it interesting who listen to you mark and, and your fans but um i decided i decided right i'm gonna i didn't even call it starting a business i i just thought i'm gonna go and start speaking at schools and 
And my school that I taught at, Rakeen, the school I went to, Rakeen, I went, oh, I'm on fire. I've got two schools already. Then did these presentations. I thought they were great. And then I'd call the next school and they'd go, sorry, mate, who are you? And I'd say, oh, I just did this talk at this school. They thought it was good. This school thought it was good. And they'd go, yeah, so the school that you went to in your school, anyone else? Oh, um, no, you'd be the first. And they'd go, okay, good luck. Call us in a year when you've got some more runs on the board. No one wanted to hear from me. Like, no one wanted to hear. And it was just rejection after rejection after rejection. Again, I'm back to no money um, and I'm single at that point because I hadn't worked out with my ex and, and I, thought, I thought I was a loser before. <laughs> I was at age 30. Uh, that was me just going, well, I remember my 30th. I had quite a few beers and, and I was pretending I was fine, pretending I was on this great journey, but I was, I've never been so flat. No one, I had this business that no one was interested in. And every single time I got the opportunity to speak, the feeling it gave me when I actually spoke to these kids about this stuff and seeing the impact it had on them, it was enough to propel me for the next month to go, just keep going. My housemates lent me money because they are beautiful people who had faith in what I was doing. Um, well, not a lot, not a lot, but it was enough to help me pay rent and and get by. And then eventually it started to gain traction. And, and, and I am in the most amazing position now where we have a team of 22, I think it is, um, which is still a smallish business, but there's 22 of us and it's, uh, we've got our reach is what makes me most proud though. I think we've got now, um, 340,000 kids every day around Australia do our curriculum. So it's a year long curriculum. Um, and we have, um, most of the elite sporting clubs around Australia doing our program and, uh, 580 businesses this year doing our wellbeing program. So yeah, it's a, it's a, we've come a long way, but it's, it's funny, you know, even just, I've just loved even telling that story, just a reminder to myself that like the hard work that goes into it, you know, like, the, I mean, no one understands it more than you, but the amount of rejections, the amount of times you think I'm not, what am I doing? And you question yourself. And, and, um, yeah, I, I had an email the other day from a, a, a lady up in Northern Territory, an indigenous woman who just wanted to tell me, um, the impact the programs had on her two kids who are, who are quite lost in their teens, but it's, it's, you know, stuff like that. You just go, fuck all the hard work, like all the self doubt, everything, it's all kind of worth it. 